Hello everyone, welcome back to Switch. Hello everyone, <laughs> <laughs> welcome back to Switch Up, and to the more podcasty episode where we look at six interesting games that we have been uh, playing. Yep. So as Mark just said, we'll look at six games, three each that we've been playing recently. They can be from any time over the course of the Switch's life, but actually, as it turns out, these are all quite new ones this time, aren't they? They are indeed. Yeah, we've got quite a few new titles to look at. Uh, so let's get on with it. Really, what are the most interesting games we've been playing? Well, let's find out. Lovely. Right, I'll start us off then. The first one I want to talk about is called Grim Grimoire Once More. Mm. So this came out back in 2007 on the PlayStation 2 originally, minus the, uh, the Once More moniker. Obviously, this is a, a remaster of some description. And it's a real-time strategy game uh, made by Vanillaware. Now, I was uh, or I read actually that they, the uh, the staff behind it were inspired by StarCraft. Hang on, this is the one from NIS, right? It's been published by them. Published by NIS. It came out last week. It's got all the weird purple artwork and like the little witch and the witch. Lady. Yeah, that's the one. This is a real-time strategy. Real-time strategy. Yep. I know, and that's exactly what I thought when I saw it. Wow. I thought it was going to be either a, a platformer or like some yeah. visual novel type thing. No, it's an RTS. <laughs> that's mad yeah tell me how it works so basically you are that witch that you mentioned right. uh, she's just started at like you know witch school whatever yeah that's uh, where they go that's where they go I think it was actually inspired by Harry Potter uh, to some degree in terms of you know the the uh, the setting so she starts at this school and she has four different classes that she goes to and they are I've written them down so I don't forget they are necromancy glamour alchemy and sorcery whoa 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 necromancy yeah sure 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 alchemy yet yeah, sorcery glamour glamour is basically fairies and stuff Right, okay. elves, elves and fairies. Okay, <laughs> but the four classes that she goes to are basically your four different unit types. Yeah, if you know what I mean. So How interesting. And, yeah, and you unlock them as you as you play as you go to classes, basically. So the way it works is that the school is attacked. Yeah. And the person who's looking for the philosopher's stone you can see the <laughs> the influence that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and you have to defend the school. Okay. As you do it by, you have a rune that you have to protect, and obviously the enemy has a rune that you have to destroy. So, you know, there's your your, your RTS element. Yeah. And you have to create units um, using your mana, and then you send them off to, to battle theirs, and you, you defend your, your base, basically. Okay. It's all done on a 2D, like, side-on view. Where are they coming? Like, I'm trying to picture this. So you're basically, if you can imagine that you're one corner of the school, say, right. and you click in the stick to zoom out, and you can see the whole area, the, the school is dark, there's your fog of war, mm -hmm. and you have to just explore, you know, you go up, left, down, right, to see the rest okay. of the school, like I say, from a side-on view. Do you direct your troops directly? You, yes, you do. Right. So, well, you, yeah, you, you know click, what? You don't go. send and... No, like, no, no, yeah, you, you say where you want them to go. Okay. Um, but like I said, you've got different units. Yeah. So, necromancy, as I mentioned earlier, you've got, like, phantoms and ghosts, and they can't be hurt by physical attacks. All right. It's like a rock, paper, paper scissors. Okay. Uh, damage system, you know, one unit is always better than another, but weak to one, two, that sort of thing. Um, I mentioned glamour, you, you picked up on glamour. Mm. So your fairies are like your almost like your archers. Right, that makes sense. And your elves are we each class has got like a, a unit that basically mines mana. So they go to and from collecting mana and then you use that mana to build more units. Do you know what I mean? Do you have to get the right unit for the so for the right battle, or can you still win a fight with the wrong unit? You will be weak to certain other okay. units, so you, you need to bear that in mind. Each um, of the kind of the miners, if you like, like I said, the elves or the ghosts, I think it is for necromancy, for example, they have to go to their own portal or to their own rune mm -hmm. to get the mana so you'll have to find more runes associate them to one type and then they'll be able to mine from there to give you more mana but the fight's always within the same place always within the as school as far as i've seen so far I'm about three hours in so okay. not not too far in but they're always in the school from what i've read it sounds like that is yeah that's where you're going to stay um but it's, it's also has like this time loop where you go and you replay the same five days over and over again weird because she's um, she's kind of seen this impending issue and no one believes her, you know? Okay. It's a, it's a very interesting concept, you know? It's not what I was expecting at all. It's not what I was expecting. No, um, I picked it up, I'll be honest, because I, I pre-ordered it. Yeah. Two reasons. One, one of the websites over here had a um, like an offer on where you got five pounds worth of points back if you pre-ordered games. It'd be rude not to. So yeah, you might as well mind, you know, you get a fiver off. And secondly, some of the NIS games, published games, become quite hard to find over time. Yeah. Some don't. But some do, so it's always a, you know, which one will it be? And I just like the look of this one, and finding out it was RTS kind of swung it for me, you know? It sounds very, well, it sounds niche, but it sounds really appealing. Yeah. 
I, yeah. It's the perfect one for this video. Well, it's, uh, from what I heard, it was uh, Vanillaware's, because I like Vanillaware, yeah. they do some good games, and it was their, it was technically their second ever game, mm -hmm. but it came out first, because the one that they were working on first was delayed, okay. had, a, had a longer like production. I'm going to sound really stupid here. Did Vanillaware make Muramasa? They did, and they made, okay. um, is it Dragon's Crown, I think it's called, I, on the okay. Vita, very good game. Another one they made, and actually a lot of the concepts that weren't used in this game here, made their way into the game I'm about to mention, is Aegis Rim. Oh, really good game. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know they were, there was a crossover there. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. That was, uh, that's probably, that's me done. I'm done with the video. I'm going to go play that. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> All right. One that I've been playing then for the last couple of days that I think was in one of your upcoming games videos a mm. while back is a game called Blade Assault. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, and this is like me quoting, it's a fast-paced platform roguelike. Right, okay. Right, yeah, roguelike. Uh, see, I heard the tone shift there, Glenn. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you said fast-paced. I'm yeah. all right with that. Platform, sounds good. Roguelike, I don't hate them, but... Does it have to be all the time, <laughs> you know? And then that is my probably first point on this one is, as you can see from the visuals, it does everything right in that yeah, department. Yeah. It looks great. I have got to say that movement isn't the best. I find that it feels like it's running at a lower frame rate than it actually is. Okay. You know what I mean? It just feels a little bit stuttery, um, but it's still responsive in terms of like, you know, to react fast to things. You've got a dash move, of course you have. You've got a jump. Yeah. Uh, you've got a double jump. You've got a special move. You've got cooldowns at the bottom of the screen. You've got everything that would work well in a linear platformer, mm. but it's a roguelite. Now, I don't hate roguelites. The thing is, we play so many of them, yeah. don't we? We have to play so many of them mm. that a curated experience now is preferable. You know, I want something that someone's designed from A to B. Now, in its defense, it does tell a very good story. Okay. It's got that kind of cyberpunk dystopian future. Um, there's a, a, a narrative that's going on with a big boss. I mean, it feels like an old Street Fighter game, you know, in, yeah, that, in yeah. that regard. You've got those kind of little story bits coming in, in between every level. So it, it didn't feel like a roguelite initially mm -hmm. until it did. You know, yeah. then when you die and you lose everything apart from a few upgrades and you know exactly where you were at. You know. Right. So what when you say upgrades, what are we talking about here? What everything from weapons um, to your core core traits, but core traits are affected a bit like uh, Isaac. Yes. You start with a set, and then and then obviously like we saw in um, Have a Nice Death, you choose your weapon, which changes a few things. Yep. But then when you're on runs, you'll find three power ups. Choose one. Oh, I'm with you. Gradually get more health. You know the drill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and it is fun. You know, I feel like I I'm being negative about it. Or there's a negative connotation. It's just what's the word? Saturation. It's a serious saturation at the minute. I, I yeah, I agree with you. And it's not anything against, as you just said, roguelites in general. I think they're a lot of fun. Mm. Um, for me personally, my humble opinion, they work best when they are those top-down dungeon crawler type. Models. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I just I don't I I can accept dying in those more than I can accept dying in a platformer. In a platform world, if I'm gonna die, I wanna have X amount of continues, or I want it to auto-save after each level, whatever, you know, I don't wanna start again. No. No, I'm not, I'm not happy with that. They're hitting you, yeah, I get that. I was on a boss just before you arrived. Yeah. And I had a sliver of health, and he had a sliver of health, and my brain was like, if I die now, I'm gonna be really annoyed. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I know I can't get back to this point. Yeah. I've, it was a good run up into this point, and yeah, it's kind of becoming, a, you almost get this underlying anxiety, death anxiety, whereas any other game where it was linear, you'd be like, well, I can use a continue, or I can quite happily get back to this point or restart from the start of the level. Yeah. Yeah, so it's. I want to finish on a positive. From the roguelike elements that I've seen so far, it does them all really well. Yeah. You know, it's got a nice linear progression in terms of pick up this power up, choose one of the three. It makes sense. It's all very clear. It looks nice. It does have a good storyline. So I think, you know, if it were to be reviewed, it'd probably be like, 70, 80%, something like that, be up there. It's just personal choice and preference at the moment yeah. is, boy, am I saturated. Bit of fatigue. Yeah. Yeah, setting in. I understand that. Okay. Uh, well, my next one, completely different, actually. I'm going to take you back to a, a time in the past, time long ago, <laughs> 30 years ago, in fact, now. Wow, that's scary. Um, Thank you, Grandad. Can I have a word as original now? <laughs> That's the granddad that has the word, wasn't it? <laughs> I was asking for one. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, that went straight over my head. Right. Back in the day, right, I didn't play PC games very much. We didn't have a PC. And then uh, we got one. It was very exciting. Yeah. And I went out to, you know, PC World or whatever it was back then. And uh, and I bought a double pack of games. And those two games were the Seventh Guest and the Eleventh Hour. Mm -hmm. And I could not mm -hmm. wait to play these games. Were they in white label boxes or were they the old original? No, no, no. It was like the, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah. brought them home and couldn't get the sodding things to work <laughs> <laughs> at all. And I never played them. And it put me off PC gaming forever. <laughs> I this man consoles. didn't know how to use MS-DOS peeps. Nah, I don't know about any of that. So, um, but anyway, the seventh guest has just been released on the Switch. 
So I tell you something interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah go for you it. You have a drink. On Twitter, mm. the day before this came out, yep. I just stumbled across a post and this guy was like, hey, these are the games that I want to see on Switch. I want 11th Hour. Yeah. I want 7th Guest. I yeah. want them to be remasters. And, and, and everyone in the comments was like, yeah, not going to happen. And I just went on there and was like, this is out, bro. This is out <laughs> next week. And he was like, yeah, you know, if only, you know, like, and I was like, no, 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 I'm playing it's it. Happened. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, ah. <laughs> so hopefully if you're in the comments right now, I hope you're happy because, yeah, let's, let's talk about one of your favorite games. Yeah. So it's funny because it's a game, you know, a lot of the time you play a game from the past that you have no real knowledge of. Mm. This is a game I've wanted to play for 30 years. You know, I mean, I forgot about it that time, don't get me wrong, but I was like, wow, seventh guest, you know, finally I'm going to play this game. And having played it, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm really enjoying yeah. it. It's, it's got that, like, you know, obviously it's a um, um, FMV type mm -hmm. game, isn't it, of course? And it tells the story of a toy maker yes. that invites a group of six people to his, uh, his mansion for a night. And it actually reminded me a little bit of the movie from the 50s, uh, House on Haunted Hill. I actually do know that one. Yeah, yeah, great film. Really enjoyed it. And you that play film. as the seventh guest, right? That yes, turns up. Hence the, uh, you know, hence the name. But even the, the I think his name's Stalf, the, the toy maker, who kind of like goads you. Something and, um, like that. Stalf, Stalf, something like that. As, as you're trying to uh, take on the puzzles. And he, a couple of the lines he says sound like Vincent Price. Right. A couple, not many, <laughs> just a couple. But every so often I was like, oh, you know. Yeah. But yeah, so the basic idea is you walk around in a first person view and it have that classic like skeleton hand that yep. will wag its finger to say you can't come this way or, or like uh, uh, uh. Tell, yeah tell you to come towards you know whichever ones you can and there are a host of puzzles there quite obscure sometimes sometimes you know a bit more uh, straightforward very little hand holding you know mm. you, you click on a puzzle you have a few goes and you you have to work out what you're going to do but what i will say is it does have something that i didn't expect to see in an older game is that you can jump into your map from anywhere and just teleport to any of the other puzzle rooms yeah yeah and there's also i haven't got i haven't seen this yet myself yeah. but apparently there's a library where you can look up hints on the puzzles okay and um if you you can get two hints and then mm. the third time it will solve it for you but i think if it, if it solves it for you you don't get the cutscene afterwards something like that right um, so the cutscenes usually involve some form of like apparitions appearing yes, don't they and then they the tell story, a little story yeah, what, what's happened what's it called fmv is that where they're just using like real video isn't it full motion video yeah yeah, FMV, yeah. Video. yeah um i i did read somewhere that they wanted to make the whole game in that you know, like real recalled the yeah. whole game. You know, the first person view that the house, but uh, budgetary reasons mm. and the fact that you know what they did worked well enough, so they used it just for the uh, the cutscenes and the, and the people. But it just has that classic look to it. Things like Night Trap and and what have you. And this game's actually quite important because this, along with things like uh, Mist mm -hmm. back in the day, this yep. kind of really accelerated the use of CD ROMs yes. for games because obviously they they needed to to have them to uh, to run. And um, it, it was a move away from floppy disks because of games like this. You know. Yeah. It's crazy to think those floppy disks had like 1.4 megs of space <laughs> on each one, you know? Yeah. My five Monkey Island floppy disks. Yeah, Man, but I think times. this used two disks. Oh, really? So, so, so two we went CDs. From flop, two CDs, sorry. Wow. So you went from floppy disks that had to have X amount yeah. to this needing two itself, despite the, the upgrading storage on them, you know? Nice. Well, I'm stuck on a really annoying puzzle where you've got to, uh, you've got a load of skeletons in, in their uh, coffins. Right, and you've yeah, got to try yeah. and like keep all the lids. I don't know if it's all the lids open or all the lids closed. Some open as you're closed. Some, yeah, and they open as you close, and there was a big maze before it, but I followed the old um, stick to one of the walls yeah. and follow it all yeah. the way around. And my word, I don't know how you'd ever get through otherwise, because it's know. all in the first person. Yeah, I've, I've solved four puzzles so far, mm -hmm. uh, if I can remember what they are. The birthday cake, we have to yeah, split yeah. it into equal parts. Uh, the spiders on the glass, uh, stained glass window. I haven't seen window. that one yet. Um, what were the other ones? The tin cans on the shelf. I can't solve it. I, I, right, I, I, that out I cheated. <laughs> Bro, there is no way you're ever going to solve it. I thought it was just putting them like A to Z as best so as you So did could, I. That's what I did. Right. No, there's no way you'll ever solve it. Okay. Like, it's a series of words, and it's like shy, sly, spryly. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, okay. But like the sentence, you're yeah, totally obscure. Because a couple of the others uh, involved sentences, building sentences. It was yeah. one to do with like planets or something, and there right. was one in a bedroom where you had to use the stars as spaces. Okay. And I worked those out, feeling quite pleased about myself. Yeah. But that tin can one, wow! I was like, what? It didn't make any sense. Yeah. But even when I had the, the the like the answer, I had to have it in front of me and just copy it because oh, it man. didn't make any sense. Oh. I was like, how? Yeah, those obscure puzzles from the. If I give you the word spryly, okay. that's your clue. That's my clue. Because that's the word I'd never would have thought of. Really. Okay, I'm gonna have a go at that when we stop yeah. recording. <laughs> All right, Glenn, next up we've got a classic arcade game called Cannon Dancer from Inning Games. Yeah, see, I put this in the upcoming the other week, 
Um, and I must admit, this is not one I'm familiar with. Mm. I do like my old arcade games, as you well know, but I've not heard of this one. Um, and it was something in the comments, because I'd said like, you know, you see these a lot, these kind of O2 yeah. uh, retro games, and this one's done it fantastically well. And I said, no, actually, it is, it is an old game. It came out in 96. So yeah, good to, uh, to see that you've played it so we can talk about it a bit more. Yeah, so this is where your knowledge will come in again. So originally released in 1996, it says it's inspired by Strider. And it's going to upset you that I've never played Strider. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll have to say what the what, what are the similarities well, there. It's funny because we were talking about this one. Oh, was this the one? Ago, do you remember? Yes. And uh, this is before someone had corrected me in okay. the comments and told me that it was actually an, an older game. And you were talking about it saying it looked good. And I did say to you, it reminds me of Strider. Yeah. And it's very much the the, uh, the movement, kind of like mm -hmm. the way you pull, pull yourself up on platforms. Uh, the main character looks very similar. Strider's quite an interesting game. Sorry to go off on a little bit. No, Andrew, go. There are kind of almost three versions of, of Strider. You have the, the arcade game from Capcom. You have the Mega Drive game, which is arguably better known. Mm. You have that sometimes. Things like Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo, you have a similar sort of argument where people say, you know, which is better. And then you have an NES version, which is, you know, generally uh, regarded as pretty poor. Yeah. But it's funny, you have these completely different versions, but in terms of arcade, this uh, Cannon Dancer definitely did remind me of, of Strider. And it's funny that obviously it's a spiritual successor of, of sorts, isn't it? Oh, there you go. Perfect. So essentially what are we looking at here? We're looking at a side-scrolling action arcade. Would you call it, it's not a shooter, is it? Would you no, it's a um, platformer. It's a platformer, isn't it? With that kind of almost beat em up action to it. Strider had the big sword. Okay. Whereas here, you're, it's more hand to hand, wasn't it, from what I saw? Yeah, it's okay. very, very fast paced. Yeah. It's brutally very unforgiving. Difficult. Yeah, yeah. Like, super. But we did also say that you can learn all the patterns. You can probably see the section, if we've got it on the video, of the boss fight that you were facing. Yes. It had a very clear set of it did. patterns, yeah. didn't it? And it's ironic because straight after that, there was another mini boss which absolutely annihilated me. <laughs> <laughs> had no less of a pattern no. it's much harder to to master yeah. on the fly that first one was quite easy to to learn and, and beat that second one would have take, take, you know taken a few goes but i do love that about the old arcade games as, as difficult as they were yeah obviously they wanted your money at the end of the day it was all about pattern recognition you know the old shoot -em ups were the same weren't they exactly right so with these obviously they have a few quality of life features such as being able to rewind time yeah. which for me was essential <laughs> yeah like i'm not gonna lie the very first boss I had to just constantly, like, it was so difficult. Yeah. I don't know, you'd have to be a Jedi. But there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I think that's a good, a nice new feature that's been put in games because if you want to just rewind and you want to beat the boss and say you've beaten the boss, yeah, you know, good for you. If you're in a competition, or, you know, you've, you've used uh, something to aid you, it's different. If it's just you and you want to count as you know, completing, good for you. But what you can also do is you can rewind and you can learn the patterns and then you can play it again without the rewinding and beat it, you know, genuinely. And it's, it's a nice way of training you almost, isn't it, you know? That's exactly what I found. I thought if if I didn't have that ability to go back, I would have quit this a long time yeah, before. Exactly. But being able to just, exactly as you said, jump back, yep. do it slightly better, yep. it's like Groundhog Day. By the end, I was an absolute G. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's good. It's nice to just, not, a lot of games, you, you spend a lot of time doing the same bit that by this point, you absolute master at. Just to get to a part that you can't do, die within 10 seconds and do it all again. <laughs> Ninja Gaiden, back on the NES, like, oh dear me. Towards the end of that game, you know, anyone who's played that will know what I'm talking about. And these games didn't have, well, a lot of them didn't have difficulty modes, right? It was just, it is as it is. As an arcade game, as yeah, an arcade absolutely, game. yeah. So that is your way of, of altering the difficulty, absolutely, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. I like the idea there of just having a save state for each different tough section and then gradually, it's a lot like, that's a weird analogy, but it's a lot like lot, uh, rock climbing that I do. You 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 learn each part and then yeah. you piece it together. Yeah. And I guess that's what you could do here. Yeah. There you go, I like that. What's next? Right, next one then, similar actually. Um, this is another game from uh, from the past. This is Assault Suit Vulcan Declassified. That's a tongue twister. That is a tongue twister for sure. Now, I again, I mentioned this in, in the upcoming games uh, a couple of weeks back now. But what was funny was that I was talking about it and as soon as I saw the pictures, I was like, that doesn't half look like Cybernator from the, mm. uh, the Super Nintendo. And then read up on it before recording and it is actually the original version of, of Cybernator. Wow, okay. That was uh, never released. This particular version was never released in the west it came across as as i just said as cybernator but this i don't know how and um maybe someone in the comments can let us know but this was censored in some way this version yes to become cybernator so i don't know what's different but what i do know is it's a very very good game yeah um when i was a kid i didn't own this game but my cousin did and he had this one he had Super Pro Protector, or Contra 3, as it's probably better known. Uh, and there was one other that, I, I'll be honest, I just cannot remember. I'll flash it up on the screen if it comes back to me. But they were all similar kind of run-and-gun games, but very different. 
at the same time and this was much more he's quite manic don't get me wrong i'm not saying it isn't but because of the size and and the you know the, the weight of your character being this huge mech it just had this gravitas to it that the other games didn't quite have yeah for me of the games that we've played today this is the one that i felt controlled the best yeah yeah you know it had a really smooth fluid feel to it the way the turret moves around you point it in the directions you can quickly switch to your fist and like smash enemies as you glide in across the screen there is a massive following for these mecha games right yeah. there seems to be a huge following this is 31 years old. I know. Yeah, it's crazy, but it plays very, very well. It does. It plays a lot better than a lot of these inspired games. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I do like that, that weight of character. I mean, it doesn't apply to all stages because sometimes you're out in space and you're gravity and whatnot. But just in terms of general stages, it just has a very different feel to it that I, I'm struggling to put into words, but I do mm -hmm. really enjoy it, you know? So you said about the Cybernator. Yes. Now, I don't know what the uh, the bits that were changed are. No. But it does say that this declassified version is the is the first time that they've got the translated version of that original. Yes. So it may well just be in translation mm. that the, uh, the differences occur. But again, if anyone does know, please do let us know. But this version as well, I think it's got a few extra bits and bobs, hasn't it? Yeah. So it's got save states, like we mentioned for the previous game. And there's also a, a super playthrough, which is uh, where you can watch someone, you know, crack it basically and, and do it mm. with, uh, without dying. Um, and the person that supplied the code to us for, for this game, for this particular game, was the person that recorded that super super play run. So fair Shout play. Out. Yeah, fair play. <laughs> what an achievement that is, because this game is tough. Yeah. Yeah, so the stages aren't always the same, are they? It does that thing where it shifts things up. So after you've destroyed that first boss, I was like, here we go. <laughs> Took control and all of a sudden I'm flying through space. Yeah, that's quite interesting when games do that because I always like it when they give you a couple of levels to get used to something before yeah. throwing in a new mechanic, you know? And the games used to do that quite a lot because they wanted to keep things fresh. But yeah, it's nice to kind of stay on terra firma, do what you got to do, and then have another level just to consolidate before being thrown off into something else sometimes, you know? Yeah, and you push in the direction you want to shoot. It took a bit of getting used to for me. I wanted to hold a trigger down or something yeah, to keep yeah. it locked, you know, and Metroid my way through it. But no, it's very fun. I think it's a very good game. I'm quite tempted to play through the whole thing and do a review, actually, one of those late reviews. Yeah, yeah, no, very good game, very good game. Let's finish off then with one that we played in co-op, and it's Figment 2, which was from Bedtime Digital Games, I think. It came out a couple of weeks back. And is a sequel to Figment 1, which you reviewed on the channel. A top-down, isometric adventure game set within the mind. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's basically it. So you're within the mind of somebody. And it does say that it encompasses almost like the two halves of the brain in terms of how you need to play the game and they'll okay. kind of conflict each other at times. So enemies are basically nightmares, for example. Mm -hmm. It has a very whimsical nature to it where you'll you'll pass by houses, say, and they're almost like your your thoughts that live in these little yeah, that's houses. that's cool, isn't it? And you'll hear what they're saying at times. The first game did something very similar. And in terms of the, uh, the art style, you mentioned obviously it's an isometric view. Now, we haven't played enough of this one yet to know if it's exactly exactly the same but the first one very much had like an MC Escher yeah. style to it you know in terms of some of the uh, the landscapes and like the staircases that looked like they could yeah, almost an illusion you know those impossible staircases yeah yeah things like that so I, I'd be interested to see how this one port oh, portrays the world as you go on but in terms of the gameplay you move along this as you say the ice the uh, isometric world taking on enemies it's very puzzle based quite simplistic yeah, yeah very simplistic this the, the, again the first game was the same it's it's more about the um it's more about just getting there at the end of the day it's not you know you're not going to be stuck on these puzzles for any length of time it's just about picking something up and, and moving it over here or yeah. what have you but it does work well in the, the general concept of the game i think you know yeah we played in co-op together and we had a few thoughts on that one as well i got to play as a little bird yeah and you were <laughs> I get why games do it, you know, you have to redesign puzzles and things like that if they've got two of you that can interact with everything. Mm. But it does make the bird feel a bit useless. Yeah, it's a bit like, um, I think we mentioned Isaac earlier, didn't we? Or, or those sort of roguelites where you play as like a familiar, Yeah. if you're player two. And it's similar here where you're, you're, yeah, you're a character that doesn't really have a huge amount of impact. You're more just assistance. And yeah, I, I don't really like that. I think I'd rather play in one player, to be honest, and have someone just calling out what to do next, you know? Exactly. And we saw with Isaac, they changed that. They did, yeah, they did. You, you, right. you then got to play as two players that could actually do everything, and it makes a huge difference to how fun it is. Yeah, so, you know, that aside, I mean, it's, it's a decent game. The first one was fun. This one is very similar. Performance-wise, though, oh, yeah, it was chugging a bit, I'm afraid. Yeah, and that made a difference. For me, the control of the bird, it has quite a floaty movement at the best of times, yeah. but with those frame drops, it really did become quite uncomfortable to play in the in the motion sickness sense. Yeah, also, a lot of the, um, well, I say a lot of the boss that we fought in this, uh, this session was very much about movement, yes. moving out of the way. 
dodging, evading. So obviously sometimes when the cameras or the uh, the frame rate, I beg your pardon, isn't helping you out, that becomes quite an issue. On a positive though, again, same uh, with the first game, I mentioned that whimsical nature, you have things like uh, boss battles where they're they're singing. That's brilliant, isn't This it? is really nice. And the only other game before I played Figment, the first one that I knew that did that was um, Conker's Bad Fur Day. Yeah, Back on the N64, nice. You had the great Mighty Pooh who used to sing at you, which was <laughs> which was quality. Oh man, he was singing at me this morning. <laughs> oh, that's so crank. <laughs> oh, it's a fact. We're all Potty friends here. Humor. Potty humor. Potty humor. Yeah, we're really keeping it classy here at Switch Up, <laughs> exactly aren't we? Right. But yeah, that is our last game, and it is a good one. Again, we don't want to sound like we're negative on it, but I think it does need a little patch. So that's it for another Interesting Games video, probably our favourite series to make. We hope you enjoy it. Let us know in the comments your favourite games as well, and we will do our very best to uh, create another glorious list next time. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, just don't forget, there is a link down there to Play Asia if you're looking to import any games. We've both actually used it recently, haven't we? Oh, yes. I bought myself uh, a couple <laughs> of J-horror games, and Mark has just bought himself... <laughs> I got the entire PSVR too. <laughs> Man, they're going to have to ship that thing over on a big boat. <laughs> exactly right. But yeah, there's a link down there. You can uh, use that link, of course. Use the code down there and you can get yourself 5% off your order. Brilliant. Thanks so much for watching the channel. For all things Nintendo-based, all the time, keep it switch up. Cheers, guys. See ya!